So let's get into this um, first example now. Now this is where some of Go's syntax might seem a little foreign to you as opposed to some of the things that you've done before. Go really isn't trying to be novel with syntax. It's trying to leverage your experience with those curly brace languages, your Java, your C Sharp, your C, even, uh, you know, maybe even Python, even though Python doesn't have the curly brackets, it has the same kind of structure. Um, but Go also has reversed a couple of things where instead of saying type and name, it does name and type. And, and, and Go's reason behind that is that it reads better um, both verbally and in your head. But even though Go has these built-in types, the strings, the numerics, and bools that all languages have, a language would be fairly useless if it didn't give you the facility to construct uh, user-defined types. That's what we'll call them, right? More complex user-defined types. And that's what the keyword struct and type is going to be doing here. All right, come back to code for a second. So the keyword type and struct is how we're going to declare our own user-defined types. Go doesn't have the keyword class. Go really isn't an object-oriented programming language. It's a, I, I call it a data-oriented programming language. And so this is the only way that you're going to have to declare um, these new types. And when you're declaring a type, you're essentially providing the compiler two pieces of information, okay? You're, you're, you're providing the compiler the amount of memory that needs to be allocated for this data, and then the representation of this data itself, right? And so you can see here that this struct type named example is based, it's a composite type. You may sometimes hear the term composite type because it's composed of these three fields existing of the built-in types, right? Like, I'm not teaching you, I'm probably not teaching you anything new here. I just want you to look at the Go syntax related to defining a type, giving it a name, and then laying these fields out in whatever order you feel are important with that uh, extra type information. And then once I've got the type declaration, you can see here on line 20, right, we're, we're constructing. If you listen to the language I use here, I really want you to kind of like zone in on the language here, right? We're constructing a value of type example, and we're naming that variable E1, right? So, and, and you saw the keyword var, so it's setting it to its zero value. So what would the zero value of example be? Well, it would mean that false flag is false and counter is zero and pi is zero, right? Like we're, we're going to set the full value to all fields set to its zero value. That's what we're doing here. So we're going to construct a value of type example set to its zero value and name it E1. There it is. And uh, this sometimes you'll see me use a special plus operator in the print. It just gives you a different style of formatting. Go has three formatting styles for structs. This, this, with the sharp and the plus. Um, play with all of them when you do the exercise. See which one you like the best. I like the plus the best. It, it, it reduces the noise in the output. We'll see in a second. But what if I wanted to construct a value of type example where it's not going to be set to its zero value? So, Go has what we call um, literal construction, literal construction. And literal construction is done with these curly brackets. And you will probably see a lot of code in Go in your lifetime that looks like this, especially for struct types, where developers for some reason in Go love using this empty literal construction syntax. But I don't like using empty literal construction for a couple of reasons. One, as I've already said, I want to use var for zero value. And though empty literal construction for a struct type will give you zero value, empty literal construction doesn't always give you zero value for all the different types there are in the system. It is for the struct type, but not necessarily for everything else. I'll show you an exception at some point. But listen to the words I'm using. Eric, show me for a second. 
Listen to the word I'm using for this syntax. Empty, empty literal construction. I didn't say zero literal construction. I said empty literal construction. These curly brackets are really for the literal construction of a value, something that you want to set, initialize it literally to. And when you don't literally set it to something, then you hear me saying empty. And empty is not necessarily zero value. And so what happens is that if we're really looking for code consistency in language, in syntax, then I think we have to really want to, we want to do our best to match, the, match it up. So a lot of developers will use this syntax. I think it's wrong to use when you can avoid it because, again, empty literal construction isn't necessarily zero value, though it's, but it is here with this particular type. All right, let's come back to the. Now, if you want to construct things using empty literal construction, go right ahead. If you're consistent, again, I'm not going to complain too hard. But you won't see me do this. The only time you'll see me use empty literal construction, we talk about those exceptions. Uh, you might see it on a return, where I'm not going to declare a variable ahead of time. I'll just do the empty literal construction on a return. That's a great maybe you know use case as an example of maybe doing that syntax needing zero value without the variable declaration. But as a general guideline, you're going to see me um, use the literal construction when I want to set something other than its zero value. And if one of these fields need, will be set to its zero value, I just won't include it. Just won't include it. Don't need to include a field here if it's going to be set to its zero value state. It's not necessarily adding any value. So you can see here also the syntax of field colon value comma. And it's on every single line. And people complain about this comma all the time. Uh, when they're first learning Go. They're like, why do I need that comma if I'm at the end? It's very JSON-like. And uh, Go just chose the consistency of having the comma on every line. Uh, one of the things I like about having the comma on every line is that if you decide you want to rearrange something, you don't have to worry about that comma missing, which happens a lot in JSON when you're shifting things around. So. Just be aware that that comma is going to be needed. All right, uh, Eric raised his hand here. So from uh, Stephen, it's the only way to set a value inside a user-defined type not to the zero value is literal construction. Um, what Steve is asking me is, can I, can I do this, Bill? Can I do zero construction and then set fields? You could. And I think it's a valid question, but one of the things I'm going to teach you is if you want to stay out of trouble, you don't want partially constructed values. And what those two lines of code are doing now on line 25 and 26 is setting you up for failure because it's partial construction. And you're going to see me later on using local variables to gather all the state I need so I can do one construction of a user-defined type. And this is going to keep your code cleaner, and it's going to keep you out of trouble. I've seen code return partially uh, constructed values by accident, but it happens. And, and bugs aren't caught until they're in production. All right, let's go back to the code. So if I see things like this in code, if I see things like this in code, I'm not going to like it. I'm going to be asking you at some point um, to have some sort of variable, I don't care what it is, with what you needed. And then what we're going to do is that literal construction and just set it up right so we don't have any issues or partial constructions going on. These are guidelines that I would like you to follow. They're guidelines that I follow, and they keep me out of a lot of trouble. Um, and they'll keep you out of a lot of trouble. So don't get into that literal construction until you have everything you need to do it. There are times when you just don't. Sometimes that's a smell to me that we can't do it. Um, I've run into it before, but normally it's a smell if we can't do it. All right. So 
um, you can see the, the construction here, and you can see I can run it. And you can see here's that format with the plus V. Let me show you what the uh, format looks like with the um, sharp. You can see the sharp um, is throwing a lot more type information at you. To me, that's a little bit more noise. I, I, I tend to like just the plus. And you can see uh, if you don't even do any of those, a um, little less information. So you'll see me do plus um, or l less information here, no field information at all. So you'll see me using the plus a lot. All right. So um, now we've got our zero value again on that struct type, and we have our literal construction. Um, and literal construction is going to be used any time we can initialize something outside of its zero state during construction. The other thing here is the use of the dot operator. That's nothing novel there. Uh, you should have, hopefully you've seen that type of syntax before. Value dot field, value dot field, value dot field. Go, go again, not trying to be novel uh, with any of that whatsoever.